a lot of soul. Panzer 38T is one of those vehicles that tends to have something of a cult following in World of Tanks. Maybe because it looked kind of cute, maybe because it's kind of capable in the game. Either way, this is a vehicle that I love to hate. And uh, hopefully by the time we finish this video, you'll understand why. Now, the other thing to talk about is the name Hetzer. Uh, Hilary Doyle has some pretty clear things to say on the matter. Uh, he points out that there is absolutely nothing in the documentation whatsoever that states that the Egg Panzer 38T was referred to as Hetzer. Uh, there was the E-10 program, a small little tank destroyer which looks kind of like a 38T. And the theory is that sometime after the war, some people found some papers for the E-10. They found some papers for the 38T. They realized that the two vehicles looked pretty similar, mixed them up. And ever since that day, Jagdpanzer 38T has been commonly and lovingly known as the Hetzer. That said, there is a note by Spielberger and he has found apparently a document from the inspector of panzer troops saying that one unit, at least, called the thing Hetzer. That said, to me, it's the Jagdpanzer 38T. That's the last time you hear me say the word Hetzer on this show. The vehicle that I'm in front of here at the Military Vehicle Technology Foundation is technically speaking a G13. Now, the G13 was a Swiss requirement built by the Czechs after World War II, some of them including this, with parts left over from 38T production during the war. And this one has been backdated visually to look like the Eggpanzer 38, mainly by removing the muzzle brake. But if you have a look inside, that's where the difference is apparent. You can actually immediately tell if you're looking at the G13 or a 38T. The story starts back in December 43. A company called BMM in Prague, uh, formerly known as CDK. And uh, they had started producing self-propelled guns. And there was thought going out, could they make assault guns or self-propelled anti-tank guns? And the idea was that they could use the technology from the 38T light tank. It was more of a medium tank back in the day when it was created. However, unlike the depiction in Girls and Panzer, it wasn't simply a case of dropping a 38T superstructure on top of a Panzer 38T body. In actuality, almost everything in the vehicle is new built to new specifications and almost nothing is carried over from the old vehicle. But because everything was developed from it, that's why it looks so much like it's simply a rebuild. It's not, but uh, it looks close enough. Anyway, so we're gonna have a wander around. Uh, outside, tracks, inside. God help me. I'm not looking forward to that bit. Again, you'll see why. And uh, hopefully you'll get to know a little bit more about the vehicle that you've come to love. Front of the vehicle, pretty simple. We've got a black outlight on the left. The tow eyelets here, which are basically part of the side armor panel, just extended. And it also gives you a shot of how the sides are angled inwards. On the other side, we have the pig's head mantlet. Now, there were two kinds of mantlet on the 38T, or two primary kinds. The pig's head was this lighter version. Uh, initially, the vehicle was 200 kilos heavier at the nose, and the suspension just was not getting on very well. So uh, uh, by changing to this new mantlet, they saved 200 kilograms and they did a couple of other changes with the suspension and the vehicle became more tolerable. This Yoki here, that's simply a base block for the jack. Lastly, we can see the traditional German uh, interlocking system of armor plates, which shows you just how thick the armor is top and bottom, 60 millimeters. If you look at the running gear, it looks very, very 38T-like, but almost nothing is carried over. The wheels are now a larger diameter, uh, 82 centimeters. The suspension has been beefed up twice, particularly the nose to deal with the extra weight. The tracks have been widened from 29 to 35 centimeters. There are 96 links per side. About the only carryover is the return roller, a single one up here, and that basically is taken straight from the Panzer 38T. As you go around to the back, even the uh, idler wheel with four holes in it, very 38T-like. 
Coming around to the back, of course, very heavily sloped. Single exhaust pipe with a flame hider. Earlier versions of the egg pans were actually the exhaust would come down and there was a muffler mounted horizontally. This is a simple cover and all it is, it covers a pass through for the hand starter, it's a hand crank. Put that in, crank away. A lot of the German engines of the time, it was actually in the manual that the electrical starter was only to be used in emergency and that the preferred method of starting was actually the hand crank. This is a port for the cooling water heater. So if it was god awful cold and your cooling water had frozen, you'd open this up, you put a heat lamp in there and the cooling water would melt and you could start running your engine that way. The last thing on here is you can just see the eight hole idler wheel on the right side. That actually brings up a point. Eight on one side, four on the other. And in fact, the inside of that one is also eight. Oftentimes you'll find people on model four or whatever, looking in a model, especially in the competition. And they'll look at it and say, that's wrong. This never happened. They would never have done that. We've been around long enough that that's not necessarily the wisest course of action. The magazine called Model Railroad, they used to have a department every month called, there is a prototype for everything. And be it that the lettering had started melting, uh, filthy aircraft, where it's most aircraft mechanics will say you'll never let an airplane get dirty. Uh, so something simple like a mismatch of idler wheels, very, very commonly done. And uh, so if somebody comes up and you say, that would never happen in real life, yeah, tell him to prove it. He won't be able to. The next thing to do is to climb up and start opening up hatches. Of course, the first thing I do is I close one. On the left side of this is the motor, on the right side is the cooling system. Opening up two nice big hatches, although because of the slope of the vehicle, it's actually kind of hard to get a, a solid grip. Starting on the left hand side, there's the battery for the 12 volt system. Behind it is the fuel filler cap. There are two interconnected fuel tanks. The left fuel tank holds 220 liters. The right fuel tank holds 100, uh, giving a theoretical total distance on the road of 180 kilometers. Now, of course, theory and practice are two entirely different issues. No doubt they probably went 80 kilometers to start looking for a fuel tank. The motor is basically the same 7.2 liter inline six by Praga that was found in the 38T, except now it's been operated to produce 160 horsepower at 2800 RPM instead of the earlier 128 at 2000. There were experiments to try to get the thing to crank out 200 horsepower, but they were not successful. Apparently the gaskets kept blowing. The engine is connected to a five-speed Praga Wilson transmission. Uh, that's connected to a planetary steering system. Although uh, the geared system gave a nine meter radius, the clutch and brake system added onto that actually could reduce the radius of the turn. The wedge shaft between the engine and the transmission, unfortunately, was something of a weak point of the vehicle. And a lot of Jägerpanzers were uh, hors de combat, shall we say, because they broke down uh, this one significant failing. Cooling for the motor was a bit of a problem. Uh, the, the significant one was that you just had a small little air vent at the back there that all the air had to go through. As a result, it required quite a powerful cooling air motor and uh, that actually sucked up a lot of the engine's horsepower, uh, thus reducing the overall performance of the vehicle. The top speed, of course, never got to 60. It actually topped out somewhere closer to 40 kilometers an hour.